Welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House US to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode 212, Hapa and Varjayana Yoga. So in the context of trying to elaborate and create a modern form of Tantric Abhidharma, which is not esoteric in some cultish way, but is in a way automatic, like is quantum physics esoteric? Yes, in a way it is. And neuroscience, is it esoteric? Yes, because someone has to be a real professional, have studied for years, and really knows about the anatomy of the brain, or they really know about the subatomic particles and all this mathematic, complicated mathematics. So they have to know all of that stuff in order to be able to use it. It isn't that it's a sacrilege if some regular person reads or tries to read a quantum physics book or a neuroscience book, but they're not going to get a great deal out of it. It will be secret from them in a sense, or hidden from them, because they don't have the prerequisite understandings, right? So in that line, I'm trying to develop it. And the teacher training would be to develop it to fit with the injunction by uh, Feuerstein, the great writer and yogin Feuerstein, whose work tradition is kept alive, I think, by his wife and students, who insists that Vajrayana is what the Hatha Yoga is aiming for. And also, I think James Mallinson may be soon coming out with a book that will a little bit contradict in one way, but we'll, no, let's say we'll agree with this by showing that Hatha Yoga does create, connect to Tantra. I think the question may be between him and his teacher, his Sanskrit teacher, whether it's, it's Shaibai Tantra primarily or Buddhist Tantra primarily, and that has to do with the relationship between Shaibai and Buddhist Tantra. But, you know, the, the Buddhist Tantra, like Nagarjuna's Five Stages, he says in one of the chapters, I think the fourth chapter or something, he says, I do, we do, we, when we, once we're adults, once we get past the self-consecration stage, we don't care about Buddhism, Vaishnavism, Shiva, Vishnu is fine with us, same as Vajradhara to us, Shiva is same as Vajradhara to us. We don't make this kind of religious sectarian issues, he says. Nagarjuna, the, the great founder of the noble tradition of the esoteric community teaching, which is sort of foundational in, in my world, of the Buddhist science, of the Tantric Abhidharma. You know, that's why Tsongkhapa, and of course I follow Tsongkhapa, the great Tantric Abhidharma, so Tantric scientist, as well as yogic practitioner. So I'm trying to follow that, and I'm trying to develop that, and I'm considering Hatha Yoga, Hatha yoga adepts to be kind of my clients, whether they show up or not, but you know, future generations of them, if somebody gets a little bit training in this orientation. So therefore, therefore, they combine their Hatha Yoga, Asana, and Pranayama, and all these six branches, Shadanga stuff or Ashtanga stuff. They connect that with the Tantric Mandala idea and also the Tantric social science because there is such a thing as tantric social science, there's tantric historical science. There's the idea that the siddhas are engaged in changing societies as well as individuals. They're not like, it's again, it, they're, wrong, they're subjected to the wrong stereotype that we get about Buddhism, that everybody who does Buddhism, what they're trying to do is just leave the world, you know. Whereas the Mahasiddhas, the great 84 Mahasiddhas, you know, they're totally all reborn in Tibet according to the Tibetans. That is to say, they worked on their tradition in the wonderful forum of the liberated, you know, Buddhified, you know, Krishnafied, Ramified, 
you know, Shiva fied, Vishnu fied, India, up until the foreigners started coming in first, the Persians and Arabs uh, under the banner of Islam, and then the Europeans under Christian banner. And in the last thousand years, their own culture was then pushed backward by these outside invaders, you know, more barbaric types. But then the, the Siddhas then said, well, we'll take the work up to Tibet. And they refounded the preparatory university institutions. They refounded the personal lineages of yogis and yoginis. They refounded, they translated all the key books. And they re were reborn as Tibetans and Mongolians to maintain the tradition. And they may now be being reborn even around the world because we're getting close to the time when the tantric history, you know, scientific history, the grand narrative of Shambhala, of the, of the wheel of time, of the time machine, will be um, developed, um, although it may still be a few centuries. So you better cultivate your ability to be reborn consciously wherever you want to be, if you want to be present for the fruition of that grand narrative, in case it, it's true. Which, of course, I'm not really certain it is, but I sense it is, and I want it to be. Because it's a time when all spiritualities are honored in the world, when human beings are fully honored to bring out all their full abilities according to whichever spirituality they have, with the science from the Abhidharma, the scientific spiritual teachings that can fit with any mystical side, what in the past has been mystical side. Myst mystical only means hidden. It's only been hidden because of the backwardness of all the societies where the mainstream institutions were, where, where, where the mainstream institutions were concerned with suppressing people, actually. Intimidating them and suppressing them because feeling that they can't handle their full life energies. They'll somehow end up being aggressive with each other or they'll overdo their pleasure seeking or whatever it is that they'll do, they'll, they'll cause trouble. Has been the attitude. Whereas the Shambhala vision is a world where the human being fits well and can manifest their full energy and the environment and, by, and caring for the environment without harming it, because realizing the interconnectedness with the environment. You know, the negative thing that Shambhala will be overcoming when the exoteric finally does become universally exoteric, but of course that advanced with its advanced levels, will be when beings are well interconnected, fully relativized, fully unable therefore to harm others because feeling in some sense, they are others. Everyone feels that, to some degree at least. Nobody feels that anybody else is ultimately life and death level alien, in other words. And nobody therefore is that much afraid of each other. I did meet in a dream some Shambhalans once, and I couldn't understand their language, although I think they are speaking something like Sanskrit. But it was very different from the Sanskrit that we know, because well, I knew they were from Shambhala in this dream, and I won't tell the dream at length, but I realized that these were people who had no fear of their throats ever being cut. So there was very mellifluous the way they spoke, and they was very subtle, you know, the consonants, they weren't, they weren't sort of staccato, powerful, you know, like sharp consonantal intervention in the flow of sound, you know, it was really beautiful actually that there was a possibility of human beings who had no fear of any kind of violence. Like I realized they, there was there for such people. It was a dream, you know, of course, and, and I might be wrong. So anyway, I'm trying to think of organizing this, uh, this um, teacher training system. And I think that the main texts that we will use will be, we, of course, we'll deal with the Yoga Sutra, and we'll deal with the Dhammapada, of the Buddha Yoga Sutra fitting with Dhammapada, sort of coming from the same era in India. Then Bhagavad Gita fitting with the Vimalakirti Sutra, also coming in in similar eras, that we could say. Maybe some other biographical things about Buddha. 
and then later on Shanti Deva and the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, Pradipika and uh, or maybe Yoga Vashista and Shanti Deva. We're still working on the curriculum to get the exact thing, and because um, it will be sort of a, because you know most people who do Hatha Yoga at the advanced level and want to be be a teacher. They are somewhat aware of the Yoga Sutras and the Hinduism. Some may be Hindu, some may not be. The, 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 wise, the wise yoga teachers don't insist, but some of them naturally gravitate toward that. I myself also do, but, but I have a Hanuman here, thanks to Baba Ram Das and Krishna Das and Nina Rao. They have turned me on to Hanuman. And um, I think of Hanuman as the progenitor in myth of the Tibetan people, actually. There is a story like that. But they, but they don't call him Hanuman in the Tibetan language. But he is a Bodhisattva monkey who is ancestor of all Tibetans. So that, you know, totally love Hanuman from beginning and end. Without him, we would not be able to get to Shambhala, I think, you know. So anyway, so that's it. And then, But then they often don't know the Buddhist side and they have some wrong idea about the Buddhist side that it's all just some meditating and forget about the body and just leave, go to Nirvana, which is wrong. And I, I want to correct that. So that's what I want to do. And uh, now that I'm retired from academia, I want to teach more in a Dharma sense, and I want to learn more in a Dharma sense with the new, with the batches of students. Who well, I think that you know, Michelle and I will build it, and they will come. And we do have Menla, Hidden Valley, Bayou, you know, like a Shangri-La Valley. Um, Shambhala itself is not a valley, by the way. Shambhala itself is a huge country with 96 cities and things like that. And, uh, but, um, but Shangri-La is a, is a fantastic hidden valley where you feel rejuvenated. And we do have, and Menla is one like that. Menla is named after a medicine Buddha, healing Buddha. And we're gonna do it there, on the 30 days a year, and in, in 10 day sessions. And if it really goes well, if there's a lot of demand, we might do like one whole 30 day session type of thing in the future, but we're starting with three 10-day sessions. And I just want this to go out on a podcast, and I would be grateful. I would like to know from all you yogis and yoginis out there, whether you're Buddhist or Hindu or neither or secular or Taoist or Jewish or Muslim, you know, although probably it would be Kabbalah and Sufi if, if it, those traditions, and the Christian mystic, you know, like Teresa of Avila and these kind of Hildegard of Bingen, John of the Cross, you know, you know, sort of the esoteric level, Meister Eckhart, esoteric level of all of those Abrahamic, of any of those Abrahamic teachings. Whatever your personal thing is, it doesn't matter. You enter yoga, you'd like to be more professional about it, you'd like to develop yourself more, and you're thinking maybe of making that a kind of profession for yourself, otherwise why bother to do teacher training? You know, maybe you work in a, some other kind of company and you're thinking, well, maybe I should make a center where I teach this. You know, maybe that would be, a, that maybe that's a career choice. Well, you know, there's all this thing about everybody being unemployed. A robot is going to take everybody's jobs. One thing you can be sure, no robot is going to be able to teach Vajrayana Yoga, time machine yoga, Kala Chakra Yoga, which is what we're working on. And we don't have it fully developed. And, uh, you know, many of you might already have some initiations for any different lamas, and that's fine. And then you can sort of feel the mandala in another way. Okay, now, what, what I said about that, but I'm so mainly talking about Hindu and Buddhist at the moment. And this is the great thing of the Kala Chakra mandala. In the Kala Chakra mandala, in the central section called the Great Bliss Wheel in the middle of the there's like five wheels. In the Kala Chakra Mandala, there is Buddha, known as Time Machine Buddha. It doesn't look like a Shakyamuni. It looks almost like an alien being. It has 24 arms, has three throats, four faces. There are only two legs and a main torso. Is in union with the female. Usually, sometimes he can be in his Lone Ranger form. Sometimes he can be a female Lone Ranger form. <clears throat> and then around him are the energy shaktis, you know, and that's sort of the most inner thing. And that could be seen as a kind of form of Shiva, according to Vishnu, it wouldn't matter. 
Then outside that are a bunch of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in the mind mandala, as it's called, because it is, after all, Buddhist mandala. But then in the speech mandala, there are 64 Vedic speech goddesses, because language and speech are the female wisdom articulation shaping things in the universe. And the main deities in the eight, eight petal lotuses where those 64 deities, 64 Vedic speech goddesses reside, the main deities are eight Hindu divine couples. But there's a little subversive thing to put it. The females are the big one in the couple, not the male. And the male is a little one. So you have like Mrs. Ganesha and Mr. Ganesha. It's a little guy in her lap, kind of. You have Mrs. Kumari and then Mr. Kumara in his lap. You have Mrs. Brahma and the little Brahma. Mrs. Vishnu and Mr. Vishnu. Mrs. So the misses are pretty important in that speech area, but the the eight gods are there. And then in the in the body mandala, the, there are tw there are twelve lotuses, and there are all the there are, there are the thirty deities of the days of the three hundred sixty day lunar year. But then the male gods are the main partners in the twelve. There's twelve of them, and they are the main ones. And then they have their partners, female partners who are littler and wrapped around them, you know, male-female union and all those deities. And then outside of that, there's a kind of final wheel where you have those dragons, nagas, you know, serpent dragon types from the oceans. And then you have some very fierce furies who are animal-headed female goddesses. And then everybody, the, the 27 lunar mansions, uh, 27 or 28 lunar mansions, the the constellations, which are then the constellations and the all kinds of, you know, Mars, Jupiter, planets. You have all kinds of uh, other days so that every divinity is there. And um, of course, this is, was created in the Shambhala country and in India. And so more or less more Indian things are being emphasized, which in those days was the center of the Eurasia, really, was the most advanced civilization. Eurasia in Buddha's time was India. So... In the future, we can incorporate any other deity from anywhere else who wants to join. Coming from China side, from Kunlun, coming from the Abrahamic side, from Mount Sinai, or wherever it may be. You know. So, uh, now the key thing, unless people think that somehow the Hindus are being made subordinate here, they're, the Hindu deities are, they're not. They are, in one way they are, but in one way they aren't, because... Every single one of the beings in the mandala is the Buddha. So they're all seen as Buddhas, but Buddha's taking the form of Vishnu, or Buddha taking the form of Shiva, or Buddha. they're all Buddhas. So they're all Kala Chakras, in other words. And that Buddha is not a Buddha associated with Buddhism, it's associated with Kala Chakraism. And Kala Chakraism, what does it mean, Kala Chakra? Chakra means a wheel, Kala means time. And... Um, the wheel is like we say nice wheels about some guy with a great motorcycle or a great car that we really like, like a Tesla. You know, say, oh, beautiful wheel. What a great, I have some really neat wheels, we say. So it can mean a machine. So Kanachakra time machine means time machine, really, if you want to literally translate it. Time wheel or time machine. And what is the machine? The machine element is evolutionary machine. It is the... It expresses the vision, which is very similar, very close to a divine vision, a monotheistic. It's the closest thing that Buddhism and Hinduism can come to monotheism. But it isn't exactly that. It's just a little short of that because what it says is that love and compassion have the power to make every life in the universe have a happy ending. That is to say, continue living happily. Which is what happy, happy, does, having a happy ending doesn't mean die nicely. <laughs> it means live happily without death. That's the happy ending. And um, uh, but beings, in order to be able to do that, they have to develop the capacity to do that. So that's where evolution comes in. And so it says that uh, that the power of love and compassion expressed. By finding the wisdom and the and the technical skill and the magical ability to be able to reshape the flow of life of matter and energy to make it optimal to all its participants, 
that there is such a thing. But that same kind of injury doesn't create the suffering that some people, that some beings, many beings, still experience. But so, so whereas the monotheistic thing is difficult because some being creates it all, and yet, and yet is somehow not responsible for the suffering. So, so then that creates a thing where it doesn't compute. It weakens, it weakens the believer, weakens their faith. Whereas the idea that it's, it's not created in a way, and therefore it's just a mistake one is making, and that the that the force of love is so strong that one can can find out the nature of one's ignorance and mistake, and one can find freedom within this infinite life of bliss, freedom indivisible, bliss void indivisible, bliss freedom indivisible. So that's what kalachakraism means. It's very close to the true believer. Of any particular God, that Krishna loves you, that God loves you through Jesus for your Christian thing, that God loves you through Moses or through being a chosen people and the Jewish thing, that God loves you through Kizer, you know, the the mystical, the Manjushri of the Sufis, which the sort of social, you know, Sultan King king-oriented versions of, the, of those things as religions won't let you know. That's why it has to be mystical in those things. Because if you go around saying, yeah, God wants, God loves me so much, he wants me to be equal with God, then they are going to execute you in the regular exoteric ones, in the old days, but no longer once Shambhala is here. Well, that's the definition of Shambhala is that no, everybody is, has that awareness and yet they exercise that sense of divinity of themselves with, with a responsibility out of love for others because they realize that divinity is love. And love means wishing every beloved to be happy. And every being is your beloved. You wish when you, when you really expand your encompassment of infinite relativity, free relativity. Okay? So that's the Kala Chakraism I'm talking about. And in a way, Buddhism opens the door to it in a scientific way, but Shaivism, you know, like the great Abhinava Gupta in Kashmir, he quotes Kalachakra Tantra. Of course, it's, he thinks himself as a Hindu. He doesn't, at least at any text we've discovered, he doesn't say, well, it's the same, we love it too. He doesn't seem to make a, a Shaivite mandala that we know of, which is sort of the, where Shiva is Kalachakra, but I haven't seen that. You know, somehow he still has that connotation of being a destroyer of Shiva. Just like even Vishnu, when he shows himself as Mahakala, to, in the Bhagavad Gita, he seems to be, their time is seen as a destroyer. Time is seen on its more superficial level as, a, as impermanence, you know. Whereas, whereas Kala Chakra, the time machine, is time is compassion and love. Giving beings the time. The forum, the theater, the the pedagogical universe, within which to learn to be one with that universe and thereby enjoy it fully, without ever pretending to have created that for them. In fact, part of it is recognize that it hasn't been created, and one is going to enjoy it as an uncreated, therefore eternal thing. It, by being uncreated, it becomes indestructible. indestructible. But that's complicated, I know. It's, of course, it's inexpressible. It's not really complicated, it's just inexpressible. Because when you try to speak about it in dualistic, linear, linguistic terms, then it won't make sense, ultimately. And that's why there's no dogmas, no ultimate dogmas in Buddhist science. They're totally not. You know, if you think there's a fixed self-soul that has your own identity stamped on it, and you can discover it and experience it and validate it and prove it to us, we'll accept it and we'll change our theories. <laughs>
Greetings and salutations, podcast wallas. This is podcast producer Justin Stone Diaz, and I'd like to welcome you to this episode of the Bob Thurman Podcast. This two-part podcast was originally recorded July 2019 at the home of Robert and Nena Thurman, and originally was broadcast as a video teaching on Facebook and YouTube. To watch the full video version of this teaching, please look in the podcast description or visit the Tibet House U.S. YouTube channel. You can also find the Facebook Live on Professor Thurman's Facebook page. As we heard in the first part of this week's episode, Professor Thurman gave an in-depth history of Vajrayana and Hatha Yoga's connections. And to prepare for his invitation that's going to follow in the second half of this week's episode. If you're inspired to learn more and participate in developing this teacher training at Tibet House's Menlo Retreat in Dewa Spa in Phoenicia, New York with Professor Thurman, look in the podcast description. We'll provide links to reach out to Professor and send him your information. You can also reach out to Professor Thurman on most social media platforms, and there is a contact form on his website. He hopes to hear from you, and stay tuned. The second half of this episode is his in-depth, detailed invitation to Hatha Yogi practitioners and students of Vajrayana Buddhism. The Bob Thurman Podcast is brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and listeners like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, including special VIP invites to DASA tours around the world with Professor Thurman, please visit tibethouse.us. Trips in 2019 with Geographic Expedition include Bhutan. All trips benefit the work of Tibet House U.S. and Menlo Retreat in Dewa Spa in Phoenicia, New York. Weekly interstitial music is generously supplied by our dear friend Tenzing Chogel. To learn more about the music and work of Tenzing Chogel, visit his website at tenzingchogel.com. And now, back to the second half of this week's episode with the reading of Patti Smith's poem, Oracle, by Barry Gough. I am considering starting up a teacher training tradition at Menla Mountain Retreat with the partner Michelle Lowe, who is a an accomplished yogini, longtime student of Richard Freeman, the great Richard Freeman and Mary Taylor couple and also other great yogis and yoginis in the Hindu yoga tradition. And also in the last few years, she has come to be a good scholar and practitioner of the Anixal Yoga Tantras and also some of the other Tantra levels of Tara, Vajrayogini, Kala Chakra, especially Kala Chakra, 
that I know about, although I don't give tantric initiations myself, I'm not qualified, I, I take them mainly from His Holiness the Dalai Lama myself, and she has done that. And, uh, <clears throat> but I am deeply interested, and I am also not a very good Hatha Yoga type yogi. I did used to do it up through my 30s, but then I guess I had a gap from 40 to 65, maybe 25 year gap where I was all talking and desk, desk ridden, uh, writing, talking, lecturing, and um, I didn't keep up my Hatha Yoga. I'm trying to get back into it, but I have so many du duties that uh, in the Tibet movement, in the Tibet house movement, and until recently in academic teaching, that I've not done well with that. But I'm going to get back more into it. Part of doing the teacher training with low as I will study as a student, more the Hatha Yoga part. I'll try to do that during my late 70s and 80s. Uh, also, I, I have set myself to learn German and Russian to a greater degree, and Spanish, actually revive my formerly fluent Spanish, in order to teach Dharma in those languages, since I recently retired as an active lecturer at Columbia, and I'm a professor emeritus there now. So I want to do that. But I want to do this thing. And then the type of training that I want to do with Michelle, and she wants to do as well, it's something we're developing. It isn't like a set thing in the sense that, um, you know, I remember first bumping into this with, well, Richard Freeman myself. He and I have been doing Buddha and yogis for quite a while. One student of mine who was a Tibetabi Joy student named John Campbell, helped me start it, but he's not active in that now. He also, like me, he's in a mode of family supporting and working and so on. Uh, but I hope he will come back to being uh, active in it as a well-trained well uh, Ashtanga yogi, friend of Richard's also, and he helped bring Richard to me and me to Richard. And uh, before that, we did some sessions with Dennis and with um, with Eddie, and um, and now Richard and I and Mary, we continue to do Buddha and Yogi sessions, which we do. We're doing one in London, coming up. But when I say teacher training, I'm talking about something really completely new, in the sense that you know F George Feuerstein, who I never met and who has passed away in an untimely manner, sadly. I remember reading in a book of his, how in his later books, that he said that to do Hatha Yoga fully, you need to understand and know something and be practicing also Vajrayana. And by saying Vajrayana, I think he meant primarily Buddhist Tantra. Uh, although I would say that Shaivites and Vaishnavites have their own version of Vajrayana. Also, both Buddhist and Hindu types. I think Taoists have a kind of Vajrayana also. And not to mention Kabbalists, Christian mystics, and Sufis. So in a way, all of them, you could say, who are doing more advanced things in an esoteric way historically. I think they all have a way of trying to work with the subtle body, with out-of-body experiences, you know, like mystics who meet Kizar, as far as Islamic ones go, or Christian mystics who meet Jesus, who who, who they believe exist. These kind of people believe that um, such beings exist in heavenly form, but then the heavenly beings can communicate with the human beings if the human beings are open in a certain way, and that's certainly the province of the Buddhist tantras. So what I'm talking about is elaborating a kind of uh, esoteric thing which was traditionally esoteric, but perhaps not making it quite as esoteric, but on the other hand, not breaking any of the esoteric commitments. The esoteric commitments in the Buddhist Tantra case have to do with whatever the, the guru allows. And my guru is Dalai Lama, my main guru at the moment, I've had other ones. 
but my main living one is His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And he has encouraged me to publish of the Unexcelled Yoga Tantra Perfection Stage. He originally asked me when I was a young scholar to translate the Ngagrim Shimo, the great stages of the mantra path for a general audience. At the time, his senior teacher and one of my initiating teachers, his Kapche Lingrumuche, was not in favor of that. Although he's back down in the sense that if Dalai Lama thinks so, I guess I can't say, no, you shouldn't do it. But I'm, you know, I wouldn't have said to do it. So based on those sort of little bit permissions, and also based on the fact that I personally am not pretending to give initiations, whenever I have a student who wants initiation to practice in an initiating way, one of the unexcelled yoga tantras that may be working with me in sort of other ways, I urge them to go to a lama, of, of, who I consider a good lama, to do that. Dalai Lama being the ultimate one, in my view, but there are others who are good, and I encourage them to go there. Just lately now, in this August, there is a lama from the Jonang tradition, which is, who is quite nice, uh, whose name I am not remembering, but he's giving initiation in the Kala Chakra at the um, Omega Center. Uh, sometime later in the month, which unfortunately I am missing because I will be in South America. During that time, you know, they didn't, somehow we didn't all coordinate, by which I, I'm, I'm sad about, actually. I'm hoping myself to meet him when he gives a short talk at the Bed House. I have met him in the past in India. I think he's so great. I'd like to connect also with the Jonang tradition, where I do have some philosophical differences with some of the previous teachers in that tradition, but Kala Chakra, I have no qualms about their wonderful mastery of that tradition. I'm not a big Shentong fan, but you know, I have a way I can understand it. You know, other voidness, that means. But I'm not going to get into that today. So what I'm saying is, I hope to elaborate, and we will be starting this December, I believe, or maybe next May, I'm, I'm not certain, you know, it hasn't been put on the schedule yet, in which we will teach Hatha Yoga in the context of Vajrayana. But Vajrayana will mean not just Buddhist Tantra, although that's my primary orientation, but also Shaiva Tantra, people who work with Shaiva Tantra, the Vaishnava Tantra, if there's anyone who does would be open to do that, or even people who are not Buddhists or not Hindus who might be interested in sort of advanced subtle body, subtle mind yogas and who maybe are Hatha Yoga practitioners and in their own teaching maybe mainly might want to teach Hatha Yoga, but the reason I say it will be kind of combining these things or coordinating them is I would like to see this taught and I will join the first class of learners studying with Michelle, a little more than I have been able to in uh, Richard and Mary, uh, and Michelle has been in many of these Buddha and Yogi things. Um, I'm hoping to work more myself. And, um, but I want to do it within the context of the Kala Chakra Mandala. And although I'm not giving initiation in that, and even, you know, when I do Kala Chakra yoga retreats with people who do have the initiation, that's one of the things that's been building up in this direction. When I do that, I always make sure to emphasize to the students that His Holiness always says when he grants that initiation to hundreds of thousands of people. But most of them are not qualified to actually even receive or use that initiation. And he gives some preliminary teachings for several days ahead of that in basic renunciation, basic compassion, uh, spirit of enlightenment, bodhicitta, basic wisdom of selflessness, twofold selflessness, personal and objective selflessness, subjective and objective selflessness. And he says, these are what you can really use, these teachings, um, more, all of you. And maybe a very few can use the Kala Chakra one. And he even says, I'm really not qualified to give it because I'm not a great yogi. I have all these you know, social responsibilities of being the Dalai Lama. I have had all my life. And I think he is highly qualified to give it, but he always says he's not. 
but somehow they create like a vessel where someone could take from that the connection from a guru as Kala Chakra, if they have that ability and they understand what it is. And actually they say in Tsongkhapa's writings, the great Lama Tsongkhapa from the 15th and 14th centuries, he says that you have to know the vows that you're taking, what they exactly are and what are you vowing to do and not to do in order to really receive any initiation. Otherwise, it's only a blessing. If you have a good attitude, it's a blessing. And if you have a bad attitude about it when you're taking it, then it's, then it's even harmful. So you shouldn't do it. In other words, if you somehow do it because you're trying to get power mm -hmm. over somebody or you're making a pretense about it or you, you, know, you're, you want to know what it is so you can despise it or something, these kind of things are, are not, are, are, they make it you shouldn't even be there. So anyway, but I'm working on where we can use these super subtle sciences. You see, in, in the Buddhist tradition, we have something called Abhidharma. Abhidharma is the level of Buddhist teaching where the Buddhist science connects to wisdom, the education and wisdom and higher wisdom. And, you know, like Sutra, which are Buddha's direct discourses, connect to edu higher education and meditation. And the Vinaya, which is Buddha's social judgments and ethical rulings and so forth, which are not rigid, although there are four downfalls if you're a monk and so on. But anyway, uh, they connect with the edu higher education in ethics. So Abhidharma is the higher education in science, which is the province of wisdom. Because wisdom, and I don't know even if wisdom is the right word, experiential wisdom, wisdom means knowing the nature of reality the way a scientist does. And understanding reality by experience, actually, not just by theory, the way a scientist should. But Abhidharma, or Abhidhamma in Pali, is a category used in the monastic Buddhism, you know, in the, what I call individual vehicle Buddhism, and um, such as that in nowadays in Burma, Sri Lanka, and so on, although they used to have also universal vehicle Buddhism, which goes well with individual vehicle Buddhism. And then there is one or two texts called Mahayana Abhidharma, you know, universal vehicle Abhidharma, which is sort of super dharma, that means, Abhidharma means, higher dharma, and that's wisdom, scientific dharma, you could also call it, or clear science, some people have called it. But they don't use that term for the kind of scientific analysis of the compassion whole side of things and the Bodhisattva universe and the Buddha lands and all of the sort of cosmological things about the Mahayana, universal vehicle. They don't use the Abhidharma term for the Shastras, for the scientific treatises that deal with that. And they certainly don't use the Abhidharma term for the scientific treatises that deal with Tantra. And therefore, for example, when I started really studying Tantra, besides just reciting something, which I did from my 20s, but when I started really studying it in my late 30s, then uh, <clears throat> I assumed it was just meditating, kind of getting initiating and meditating, but actually it's a huge study also, because there's all kind of technicalities about it, it's because it's the science of the subtle body, of the nervous system, it's like Buddhist neuroscience is uh, Tantra, you know, involved in that. And of course, Tantra can also be used in Buddhist medicine, where there it is really scientific methodology, it's technology. The word Tantra really can be translated there as technology. And the thing about this teacher training that Michelle and I are trying to develop is that it's based on the idea that you can understand these things. You can know what Buddhism and Hinduism are. You can understand what Krishna is saying. It's not some blind thing that you can't understand it. You can. It will not just be repeating a formula will not be the understanding of it. The understanding of it will be experiencing it, which you can do. If you are a human being and a yogi and or a yogini, you can understand it. And are and you and to be a teacher you should understand it. Because really to be a good teacher, you should be seeing, you should be able to understand your student, at least to the extent where you understand their capacity. And that they also have the capacity to understand it. The bad teacher is the one who sort of secretly thinks the student will never get it. I'm, I got it, but they'll never will. And that person will not be a good teacher because they will create a prison for the student that they're just always going to be learning something because they'll never get there. 
and then that student will always feel like either they'll be dependent and then the teacher forms, forms a cult or they'll become discouraged and quit any kind of development and that teacher will just be a failure. I mean, forming a cult is all kind of failure because it won't work for long. <clears throat> or for, it can work for a while, but not for long. So we're not starting a cult. We're starting a teacher training to spread the idea that life is great and it's within the field of the love and compassion of all Buddhas and divinities. Okay? And you, and you, you can enjoy that and you can experience it. You don't have to just believe in it. Okay? And so now, so I'm doing this as a podcast now. I'm tipping my hand here because I want to know who's interested. So I think we, I'm trying to gain, regain control of my website on which I believe you will find this. Maybe it, it connects to the, my YouTube channel. Do I have a YouTube channel? I don't know. I'm talking to my friend Justin here. But I would like to have a sign-up thing where you don't have to commit to a particular thing. And, you know, we, we there will be costs involved, of course, because Menlo has to live, support to live and so forth. Actually, I'm kind of have a pension. So I'm, I'm not going to charge much, if anything. And uh, Michelle is younger, I think might need something, but she's a professional, you know, that's her job. When you become teachers, you will get some honorarium or some, some early livelihood that makes you a professional. And, um, but I would like to know what is the, you know, so you don't have to do that, but just say, you know, I would be interested in such a thing. Keep me informed. And then, so I'd like to see that. I'd like to build a list like that. I have quite a lot of people who like my podcast, and some of you will just you can keep enjoying podcasts, and I'll keep doing podcasts. Um, and um, so, you know, you don't have to do that, sign up if you don't want to. But it would be encouraging to know that as we put more effort into designing this. We pretty much have a design and probably will announce it within the month of August, even though this is, a, we'll pick a auspicious moment the month, waxing moon, and maybe the tenth day of that month, or maybe the fourth day of the sixth month, I, I forget, fourth day, that's teaching uh, day, Dharma Chakra day it's called, not Kala Chakra, but Dharma Chakra day, maybe, I don't know when that is, but I'll look that up, and so then, and then once we put it up, we announce it, it will more develop and more change probably, and we'll more refine it get down to where we give the main essence things in the Gita, the main essence things in the Bhima Kedi, not just read you know, hundreds of pages, thousands, thousands, maybe hundreds, but not thousands. Hatha Yoga Padipika, Yoga Sutra, Dhammapada, uh, you know, Bodhicharya Avatara, and this kind of thing, okay? So that's my podcast for today. It's an exploratory podcast, and I'm asking you to think about it and to let us know what you want, if you want. Welcome to the Bob Thurman Podcast. I'm Gary Gock. Today I'm reading The Oracle by Patti Smith. He was a stone boy, divined by his sister. She slept understanding, while he, by the rim, played with a ball the color of water, gazing all reason therein. He was summoned to the sibylline barren, Carried by sweetness, his mouth drew the spring. They rejoined through the ball of water, patterns foreshadowing. Darts of fortune scattered unnoticed, flew like the raven in a twisting scrawl. His transitive senses he left to his sister, 
Her tears were the color of stone boy's ball. I'm Gary Gawk, and this poetry segment is a part of the Bob Thurman podcast and is published by To Bet House U.S., Menla Retreat, and Dewa Spa under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Please feel free to share, redistribute, and post via your favorite online portal. <laughs>